Good evening. Yeah, we're on. <laughs> okay. Um, so my name is Melissa Friedling. I'm the Dean of Undergraduate, um, the School of Undergraduate Studies in the Adult Bachelor's Program here at the New School. And it's my great honor, my great privilege to welcome you to the Body, Art the Body Artist Conference on Don DeLillo. Um, the New School, I'm going to give you a little brief history. The New School, you may know, was founded in 1919 as a counter to traditional universities. So classes were open to all who might be interested in the topics that were taught here focused on political and social issues of the day and served adult men and women with an education that would enable them to be active and engaged citizens. Um, the new school started offering a bachelor's degree in 1944 to, the, uh, to address the educational needs of returning World War II veterans who would have the financial support of the new GI Bill. And the new school was poised and claimed to help students who are returning with that and, and enjoying that, um, that bill to answer the question, what did we fight for? And DeLillo's body of work, which will be addressing in the next two days certainly certainly addresses that enduring question and more and this conference will provide ample opportunity to dig in those into those persistent themes um, our adult bachelor's program here has evolved over the last 70 years to recognize and serve the passions the goals and the challenges and the questions of today's adult students and the body Art artist conference in fact grew out of an a, a undergraduate seminar of the same name created by and taught by uh, professor joseph salvatore um, who's organized this conference and i'll introduce in a moment and i would suspect that there are many here at the new school well maybe not so many a few a few new school students here tonight um, so uh, this program extends uh, this, the core mission and the founding principles of the New School to connect to community and certainly rich pro public programming of which this conference is part is part of our, our DNA and our mission. So I want to thank the conference organizers from the New School, Joseph Salvatore, Assistant Professor of, of Writing and Literature, uh, Pam Tillis, the Director of Public Programs, and Chelsea Parrish, our Event Assistant, um, and also Juana Kennedy, our Director of Administration in the School of Undergraduate Studies, who have all been working tires, tirelessly to put this conference together. And I'm, without further ado, going to, um, to invite our, um, our conference organizer, Joe Salvatore. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Good evening. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Joseph Salvatore, and I'm an assistant professor of writing and literature here at the New School. And it is my immense pleasure to welcome you to The Body Artist, a conference on the writer Don DeLillo, taking place here at the New School in New York City. Uh, I want to thank my New School sponsors, without whom this event would not be possible, the School of Undergraduate Studies, the Bachelor's Program for Adult and Transfer Students, the Liberal Arts Department, the Creative Writing Department. Thanks to all of you. I'm grateful for your support. I also want to thank our speakers who have generously offered their time and talent, many of whom have traveled great distances to be here tonight and tomorrow. Thank you so much for your presence and for your support. I want to thank some people by name. Uh, Dean Melissa Friedling, whom you just heard from, has been a solid supporter of this project from the beginning and someone I could rely on for help and advice throughout the long planning process. Thank you, Melissa. I too want to thank Juana Kennedy and Pamela Tillis for so much of the administrative help that a project like this requires. Other administrative support was generously given by Keme Soyuju, Yvonne Garrett, Rebecca Hardy, and Greg Mania. Thanks to you all. I want to thank some of my colleagues whose support and kindness helped me more than they might suspect. Rachel Hyman, Fabio Parascoli, Albert Mobilio, Laura Cronk, Luis Hermilio, Laura Lynn Turner, and Val Vinacur. <clears throat> I also want to thank some of the brilliant students in my DeLillo seminar who have volunteered to help with the conference uh, this evening and tomorrow. Uh, Maria Elena Grant, Brett Johnson, Sean King, Tucker Newsom, Mary Peterson, and Courtney Wood, who helped get the word out. Uh, I also need to thank another special student, Ingrid bonetti Veloz, who worked so hard with me to help create the beautiful website. Thank you so much, Ingrid. Um, and a huge thanks uh, I must offer to Chelsea Parrish for her invaluable help with nearly every aspect of this event. Thank you so much, Chelsea. Um, I, I need to offer a warm and, and deeply personal thanks to two of our presenters this evening, uh, Scott Cheshire and 
and John Dominey, without whose assistance this conference might not have ever happened. Uh, they uh, were, as the saying goes, there for me from the beginning, whenever I needed help, uh, even ready and willing to, take, uh, to talk by phone when texts and emails just weren't cutting it for this anxious organizer. Uh, they went far beyond what I asked of them, and they were always willing to do more. I'm entirely grateful to them for all their help. Thank you, gentlemen. And finally, I need to thank uh, Jessica Radin, my wife, uh, who carried much more than her fair share of the load these past few years, including our two babies, Ella and Ezra, so that I could attend to the work of building this conference. Thanks to you all. This conference, uh, as Melissa said, the body artist grew out of an undergraduate seminar of the same name, which I'm teaching for the first time this spring semester here at the new school. Both uh, the chorus and this conference take its title, of course, from DeLillo's 2001 novel, but I intended it to refer beyond the book to DeLillo himself, an artist who has spent a career dramatizing personal encounters with impersonal systems, an artist who has continually pitted the human body against the inhuman machine. DeLillo, then, and his artistry will be a governing theme for this two-day conference, featuring panels and presentations by both critics and artists, predominantly artists, in fact, literary artists, fiction writers considering this fiction writer and his work, what it is, what it has meant, and what it might mean now. The conference will run fairly traditionally. You've been given schedules and speakers' biographies at the door, and I will moderate each panel and introduce briefly each speaker, as you already have the bios. Each panelist will speak for roughly 15 to 20 minutes, give or take, which will be followed by a discussion and an audience Q&A. We have microphones, and we are being filmed for YouTube. Three years ago, I began the research in, on, er, in earnest for my DeLillo seminar by reading each of DeLillo's books chronologically. And then when that intense experience was over, I read every article I could find on JSTOR. And after those are exhausted, mostly every book written on DeLillo, which, as the initiated know, isn't as hard as it may sound. For though there are a good number of books devoted solely to DeLillo, there aren't that many, relatively speaking. It's a small but thoughtful, generous group of critics who have made a significant contribution to the DeLillo scholarship, uh, beginning, of course, in 1987 with Tom LeClaire's In the Loop, his monumental and influential study of DeLillo as a novelist of systems and the influence of systems theory on his work, followed by other important and well-regarded volumes by such authors as Peter Boxall, David Cowart, Joseph Dewey, John Duval, Jesse Cavaldo, Frank Lentricchia, Elise Martucci, Mark Osteen, and by one of our own presenters this evening, Randy Laced, whose excellent book on DeLillo has one of the most trenchant readings of Americana I've seen yet. But many of those outstanding books, it seemed to me, implicated both the critic and the reader in what Leclerc calls the communication loop of those critical systems of academic literary criticism that are, to quote Leclerc, written by a professor, published by a university press, and directed primarily at other academics, close quote. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I noticed something interesting. In nearly all of these books, there was often a mention of or a reference to a writer who it seemed to me after some research was not looped in those loops I just mentioned. A writer who has, since 1991, written about and helped us to understand much of what we take for granted in knowing about Don DeLillo, both the artist and the person. That writer is this conference keynote speaker, Vince Pissarro. In his 1991 profile in the New York Times Sunday Magazine called Dangerous Don DeLillo, Vince showed us someone who seems to be composed of two parts. One half, quote, normal, an Italian Roman Catholic kid from a working class family of immigrants born in the Bronx and raised near Arthur Avenue. A nice, quiet, reserved gentleman who grew up playing sports of all kinds with kids in his neighborhood, including using a football made of balled up newspaper and tape. But DeLillo's other half, we come to understand, is that of a literary genius. And in Pissarro's piece, we learn that those two parts don't communicate all that much. And so it was left to Vince Pissarro to help us understand perhaps that whole person. And it was to Vince Pissarro that DeLillo uttered his famous formulation connecting the power of novelists and terrorists in repressive societies 
and it was Vince Pissarro who helped us to see DeLillo's smile at such a formulation. It was Pissarro who helped us understand that smile, helped us to understand, to use Pissarro's own words, DeLillo's mischievous pleasure in the darker workings of his imagination, bombs making blossoms of plate glass windows, bullets pocking the plaster work. Nasty images, Pissarro says, certainly, but images of the day and terrifying evidence of the real power of art. I told the students in my seminar this semester that of all the research I did, none of those secondary sources would be assigned. We would read only the work itself, except for Pizarro's dangerous Don DeLillo, which I passed out in the first class. Vince Pizarro is the author of Violence, Nudity, Adult Content, a novel by Simon & Schuster in 2002, and is currently at work on a second book of fiction. His short fiction, essays, and criticism have appeared in such publications as Harper's Magazine, where he's a contributing editor, Esquire, GQ, The New York Times Sunday Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, Salon, and such journals as Story, Boulevard, Agni, and Open City. He started creative writing and literature at Hofstra University, Adelphi, Columbia, and NYU, and he blogs fiction and nonfiction at the site Bitter Conceits. Vince will speak for about 45 minutes, after which time we'll take a short break and then regroup to enjoy our first and only panel for this evening. I hope you'll stick around afterwards and join us on this lovely spring evening in New York City for a reception in the lobby and in the courtyard. And with that, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Vince Pizarro. Thank you. My, uh, can, can I be heard? Am I the proper distance from the, I don't want to. Um, my son said, you're going to be on YouTube? He lives on YouTube. He said, a million people are going to see you. I said, no. <laughs> One day, if we work hard, 112 people will see me. Um, the phrase body artist, and I take this up from where Joe left off, and thank you, by the way, Joe, for inviting me, and thank you for those nice things you said, and thank you for the new school. Um, the phrase body artist kind of jumps out at you with possible meanings. It doesn't merely deploy body adjectivally uh, to modify artist. It also suggests, in a less immediate way, an opposition of some kind. Joe has suggested this in his, in his introduction. Um, uh, taken from the title Body Artist, an idea of DeLillo, uh, and I'm now quoting from the website, which is a little different from what you said, but dramatizing personal encounters with impersonal systems. And uh, DeLillo as an artist who has continually pitted the human body against the inhuman machine. It's part of DeLillo's incurably ironic tendencies as an artist, however, that these inhuman machines Joe refers to are often actual humans. Um, humans acting in inhuman ways, compelled by sociopathology or bureaucracy or simply bad language, imposition and untruth to destroy what is most human. Um, this opposition can be restated, as DeLillo often has restated it, as the individual pitted hopelessly, in most cases, against the crowd. The most organized form of crowd, of course, is the state which detests the individual in especially complicated and lethal ways. But I'm also looking at the phrase a little more prosaically, um, looking at it as the opposition or the dynamic relationship, perhaps is a better, less Manichaean way of putting it, of the body on one hand and the artist on the other. Art, as we all learned in 1921, offers us the extinction of personality and escape from the self. Even the most physical artists, actors and dancers and singers must seek such moments of escape when the body is functioning separately from them as willful agents. Writers talk about this in many interviews as DeLillo being no, DeLillo being no exception, see his Paris Review interview. That moment when we become mediums, vehicles for an outpouring of coherent intentional language that we seem to have no willful originating connection to William Burroughs describes this feeling as being that of taking dictation. So there they are, the flesh, the body on one side, and the spirit or the artist on the other. At the same time, though, DeLillo is a Catholic, 
and I don't mean a Catholic by avocation or practice, but by deep intellectual training, by upbringing, by, culturation, by acculturation. Um, and to see these uh, things, flesh and spirit, dualistically, it, it, or in pure opposition, is heretical, and worse, deeply unironic. Um, in the Catholic scheme, there is no escaping the body. Even God has to be known carnally. Um, and the vehicles of grace are most often sacramental, which Augustine defined sacrament, that is, as the outward sign of an inward grace. Thus, a unifying force between the physical, the corporal, the worldly, and the spiritual or the divine, which for our purposes we call art. I've become interested in recent years in the spirituality to be found in Delilah's work. I know a couple of you are also addressing this to one degree or another later tonight in some cases, so I hope I'm, I'm not adding to that. I'm adding to that discussion rather than preempting it in any way. Delilah being raised and educated, and mostly educated, I think, I don't, I don't get the sense his family was all that Catholic um, in terms of fervor and, uh, and uh, nightmarish doctrine. Um, Nightmarish moral theology, I should say, specifically. A lot of the doctrine is quite beautiful. The moral theology gets a little difficult when you're 12 and a boy. Um, but he was mostly educated as a Catholic at Cardinal Hayes and at Fordham University. Eight years, at least, of serious Jesuits doing what serious Jesuits did back then, which is the Catholic version of the Vulcan mind meld. And in college, we know now that he seriously read uh, Teilhard de Chardin, de Chardin, and we'll have more on that later. But for now, we can agree on the relatively simple and uncontroversial point that this Catholic intellectual foundation means that in Delilah's fictional worlds, the flesh and the spirit are never far apart. Let's start with the flesh, shall we? It's always a good point of departure. I taught Cosmopolis in a course I used to teach at NYU. And uh, five or six years ago, we were doing the book. I came in that week and said, OK, what do you think of Cosmopolis? Crazy, huh? I was really working that Socratic thing. And um, this rather sophisticated young man from Los Angeles, he was by far the most sophisticated. It's a fresh, it was a freshman course, and he was, so they were all 18. This sophisticated kid from Los Angeles raised his hand and said, well, I have a new line in literature that I'll never forget. And I said, what? What is it? I was excited. I thought, that's exciting. And he, and he looked at me and he said tonelessly, I want to bottle fuck you slowly with my sunglasses on. <laughs> and I was grateful to him, actually. I'm grateful to him now because I, the, the line didn't stick with me the way it stuck with him. Um, so I was like, yeah, I can work with that. Um, it turned out, interestingly, that a good portion of the class, they were 18, as I said, didn't understand what bottle fuck might mean. And I said that was because the bottles of their times were all sort of round-topped and not long-necked like they used to be in the good old days. And uh, discussion kind of stalled after that. Um, but that's the passage I'm interested in reading to you now. So perk up. Um, the main character of Cosmopolis is this 28-year-old financial um, um, divinity uh, who, who is worth billions and billions of dollars and controls many, many more billions and billions of dollars and has a 40-room apartment on three floors on East 42nd, East, East, in the East 40s, I should say, near the UN, where he asks his, uh, his art dealer if he can purchase and put in, in his home uh, the entirety of the Rothko Chapel. Um, and he's 28, and he's going across town in a limousine. This is a, such a brilliant conceit uh, on 47th Street, which does, in fact, go all the way from east to west um, in a limousine because over between 10th and 11th Avenues is the barber that his father took him to when he was a child, and he feels he needs a haircut. The limousine ride takes all day because of various insanity that's taking place in Manhattan. Uh, and so this is it. It's the, it's the limo ride. It's you're in the limo all day long until you're not. 
Um, and at one point, his, uh, his um, chief financial officer, who has his day off and is out running, uh, has been beckoned. And she, jump, she finds the limo on 47th Street somewhere and jumps in. She's in her shorts and T-shirt and all sweaty. And she has a bottle of water, which she holds between her legs while they talk. And he starts, oh, and he's getting a medical exam at the same time. He, his, he, every day, he uh, has his, his self examined, including a prostate exam. So while he's talking to his financial, chief financial officer, whose name is uh, Jane, um, he's pushed over a, a, some sort of uh, table-like thing, and the doctor is, is doing a very careful, it seems to me, and prolonged prostate exam. But he starts talking sexy to her in, in, only, in a way only DeLillo would think up. In other words, it wouldn't be sexy to anybody else in the universe except him and the two characters on the page. Um, and uh, he says to her, you know, I see something in you. I says, what do I see? I see something lazy, sexy, insatiable. And she says, I'm comfortable with that. And so they're starting to talk to each other in this, you know, very erotic way for them. And um, she says, how come you've never spent this kind of time, we've never spent this kind of time together? And uh, he says, sex finds us out. Sex sees through us. That's why it's so shattering. It strips us of appearances. I see a near naked woman in her exhaustion and need stroking a plastic bottle pressed between her thighs. Am I honor bound to think of her as an executive and a mother? Um, then he says he sees himself she sees he's now projecting he's still speaking she sees a man in a posture of rank humiliation is that who I think he is pants around his ankles and butt flung back what are the questions he asks himself from this position in the world large questions maybe questions such as science obsessively asks what, why something and not nothing why music and not noise? Beautiful questions. It sounds a little Trumpish, doesn't it? Beautiful language, beautiful words. I have such beautiful words. I have such beautiful questions. Um, strangely suited to his low moment. Or is he limited in perspective, thinking only about the moment itself, thinking about the pain? He says, days like this, he snaps his... Oh, days like this, and he's still talking about himself. He snaps a finger, and a flame shoots up. Every sensitivity, all his attunements, things are ready to happen that normally never do. She knows what he means, that they don't even have to touch. The same thing that's happening to him is happening to her. She doesn't need to crawl under the table and suck his dick. Too trite interest to interest either of them. The flow is strong between them. This is all him talking. The emotional tone, let it express itself. He sees her in her wallow and feels his pelvic muscles begin to quiver. He says, tell me to stop and I'll stop, but he doesn't wait for her to reply. There isn't time. The tails of his sperm cells are lashing already. She is his sweetheart and lover and slut undying. He doesn't have to do the unspeakable thing he wants to do. He only has to speak it because they're beyond every model of established behavior. He only has to say the words. And she says, say the words. I want to bottle fuck you slowly with my sunglasses on. Her feet flew out from under her. She uttered a thing, a sound of herself, her soul, and rapid rising inflection. In other words, they both then achieve orgasm without the benefit of any physical stimulation whatsoever because he has said this thing. Um, sure. <laughs> of course, what we recognize is here and in the body artists which preceded this book, I believe, is that DeLillo has moved beyond realism. He's no longer writing a realistic uh, uh, narrative voice. And he started off not writing a particularly realistic narrative voice, or he got there rather quickly. And uh, he, uh, he returned to that. And I think uh, this is now a decade and a half ago, but... Um, <clears throat> I think American fiction is catching up. I think that realism's days are numbered as a primary moving force of literary art uh, in the novel and fiction. Um, <clears throat> but it's important to acknowledge that Deleuze is not descending 
or ascending, depending on your point of view, into speculative fiction here, or um, magical realism of some kind, or avant-garde experimentation. This is neo-medievalism. Say the words. It's as if Merlin, the wizard sired by an incubus, has gestured and the bodies convulse. In the film of the novel by David Cronenberg, which I, I don't know if any of you have seen, but it's great. I, I think it's great. All the computer screens in the limousine look like they're tuned to the innards of a crystal ball. With Eric Packer, that's the uh, financial guy, DeLillo uh, and Cronenberg show us why we call these guys wizards of finance. I won't belabor the point, because I've written about it elsewhere, but Cosmopolis dramatizes uh, the inescapably medieval qualities of contemporary technological American life. In the face of new technologies, DeLillo once remarked in that interview that uh, you referred to, we become fearful and atavistic. So think of the monolith rising in 2001, a space odyssey, amid the frantic leaping apes. Th they're us. Um, I first encountered DeLillo's work in the St. Mark's Bookshop, may it rest in peace, over there, uh, I think, if I'm oriented correctly. Um, it was maybe in 1981 or 82, I was 24, 25, and I came upon these uniform edition paperbacks that Vintage has just put out uh, that were in muted, almost metallic colors of gray, gray, green, gray, gray, brown, and the, the, the color framed, oh, in each case, a startling black and white photograph. These books were very appealing. They were very early 80s. They, they had a Reagan era feel and that they were kind of, the design content was suddenly fancy and elegant in a certain way, slightly moneyed looking, um, purposefully elegant, but smartly, they also remained loyal, and this was important to me, to the fully depressing atmosphere of the Ford Carter years. I think the names was out in cloth at the time, and these earlier titles, Great Jones Street, Ratner Star Players, Running Dog, were being reissued to capitalize on the wider attention the names was drawing to do Lilith's work. It was the, sort of the first book that got a lot of attention, or more attention than, than standard and not particularly compelling attention. I'd heard his name. I was vaguely aware. I was very attracted to these books as objects. I was frustrated that the author description told me nothing about the man who wrote them. Don DeLillo lives in New York City, was all they said, and even that, it turned out, was not true. <laughs> he had moved to Greece and would return to live in Westchester. I judge books quite rightly by their covers. I read to know the author, to hear the author, as much as to experience his or her art. I'm a bad man. But I bought Running Dog and Players right away. Some of you might remember better than I the photograph on the cover of Players, I think, I couldn't find my copy last night, which pissed me off mightily. I, I could feel, as so often these days, this uh, entropy cloud of senescence and Trump world sort of gathering all around me. Things are getting lost, uh, including my copy of Players. And, um, but the picture, as I recall, it was of an unmade bed that was sitting in one of the elevators of the World Trade Towers, which played an important role in the, in the, in the novel. Um, and if you weren't around then um, uh, in New York, the trade towers had the largest and fastest elevators many of us in the late 70s had ever experienced. They were terrifying. I, I thought they were anyway. And they were even worse going down than they were going up. They were, I mean, fast, but not, you know, German steady. You know what I mean? They were New York Port Authority steady. Um, so I was very taken by this picture on the cover, and um, it was the beginning of a long literary relationship between DeLillo and the Trade Towers, and I suspect that relationship is not over yet. Anyway, I read Players first of the two. There was a girl in it, plus that tremendous prologue in the piano bar. Can you imagine the piano bar of a 747 aircraft? Back way before Reagan deregulated the airlines and improved all our lives. I'm really glad to see Matt Bell here tonight is going to specifically look at DeLillo's prologues as they are, uh, in some ways, the 20th century novel's equivalents of the medieval illumination, um, full of beautifully crafted details and symbols that are ancillary to the main text, but inform it in some fundamental way. Um, 
Pammy and Lyle are the two main characters of players, and they're an entirely new type of human being. Well, I mean, they were, at the time, to me, an entirely new type of human being. Um, uh, but I knew they were real, they were out there. I sensed the man Beatty had written about them to some degree in her early New Yorker stories. We called them yuppies later, but we didn't have the word yet. Uh, and they were very, they were um, pointless in a really annoying way. Uh, they didn't know what it was they were doing on the planet Earth except having jobs and buying produce and putting it in the fridge and letting it rot and then throwing it out again. Um, I was hooked. Running Dog only made it worse. I read them all. I wanted more. This takes me to Underworld. Perhaps the first medieval moment in Later DeLillo occurs in that absolutely brilliant scene in the Pafco prologue where the pages from Life magazine drift down onto J. Edgar Hoover's head. The October 1, 1951 issue of Life indeed did feature a photograph that DeLillo describes here of a Bruegel painting, The Triumph of Death. And this disturbs and titillates Hoover in, in, in a deep way. It was part of a story about the, the Life magazine did that week on the Prado in Madrid. I can't help it. Prado? Pafco? Anyone willing to take that? Next conference, maybe? <laughs> this is my 70s training in working the text. Albert, well, Billy O's here. He'll understand. He remembers. Here's what the magazine had to say about the triumph of death. This is, life, this is real life magazine copy here. The final conquest of humanity by death was symbolic, was symbolic subject for artists during the Middle Ages. But the symbolism took on a grim reality in Pieter Bruegel's day when the armies of Spain swept over the Low Countries, ruthlessly crushing the native uprisings. In Bruegel's painting done about 1562, the agents of death spare no one. Their bony hands touch king, cardinal, pilgrim, and peasant. A fool hides under a table to escape the pale rider on the pale horse who drives the living into a chamber of doom. Far away, ships and fortresses go up in flames, and on a stark hillside, two skeletons toll the death knell of the world. <laughs> Albert's digging that. Middle brow was a lot higher up the brow in those days, did you notice? Um, than it is now. They, I can't imagine anything coming out of Time Warner to match that these days, not even close, unless it's on HBO. Have you seen The Young Pope, by the way? Yeah. Fantastic, unbelievable. Sorrentino is a filmmaker. Um, it, it's just amazing. Um, and here's the text from Danilo. Yeah, it's, this, is, this is Hoover. Sort of. Yes, the dead fall upon the living. The dead beating kettle drums, the sackcloth dead slitting a pilgrim's throat, the meat blood colors and massed bodies. This is a census taking of awful ways to die. I think this sense of death and dying are central forces not just in DeLille's work, which is fairly obvious, but behind it, actually pushing at it. The writing in some ways seeks a solution to the problem. This idea is certainly a crucial part of one's training in Catholic schools. The keeping in mind, as DeLille once said in an interview, that death can be for the sinner, quote, an introduction into an eternity of pain, end quote, a, a, a fact which he said made it possible for him to look at very big subjects, big issues, that training. And to take this thought a little further, only grace alleviates the condition I think these notions have to some degree driven him as a writer. William Burroughs talks about the death grip he felt on him in the time leading up to the shooting of his wife and his efforts later as a mode of survival to write his way out of it. In the first interview that DeLillo did, or the first major interview they did with Tom LeClaire, whose, whose book uh, Joe talked about, um, discussing Ratner's Star and its reference to crazed books that are not meant to be read, DeLillo says he has not set out to write such a book in Ratner Star, although I think he kind of did. Uh, it's the one I can't get through in any or I didn't, I wasn't able to get through it back then. Maybe I could now, I don't know. Um, but at the same time, he understands the impulse. He, he says, quote, there's an element of contempt for meanings. And I think that plural is very important there. There's a sense of drowning in information and in the mass awareness of things. 
Everybody seems to know everything. Subjects surface and are totally exhausted in a matter of days or weeks, totally played out by the publishing industry and the broadcast industry. This is all analog era, by the way. Got even worse, in other words. Making things difficult for the reader is less an attack on the reader than it is on the age and its facile knowledge market. The writer is driven by his conviction that some truths aren't arrived at so easily, <clears throat> that life is still full of mystery, that it might be better for you, dear reader, if you went back to the living section of your newspaper, because this is the dying section, and you don't really want to be here. That life is still full of mystery, is the quote. In the same interview uh, with Leclerc, he begins, uh, Leclerc asks him why there's no information out there about him, and, and uh, Delo's much quoted remark and answer to why is uh, silence, exile, cunning, and so on. But he goes on, when you try to unravel something you've written, when you, you belittle it in a way, it was created as a mystery in part. Here is a new map of the world. It is seven shades of blue. Delillo spoke these words in Athens, as it happens, where he was living at the time. The Greek word for mystery is mysterion, and the church Latin translation of that word was sacramentum, giving rise to the Catholic word in English, sacrament. To put the matter simply, the flesh and spirit combine in a vision of the world that is sacramental, and that vision frequently dominates Delillo's fiction. Indeed, in another keynote address at another DeLillo conference somewhere, one might discuss how the work, especially from the names forward, has been progressively, progressing steadily from the realm of outward signs to the realm of inward grace. I first became aware of the sacramental quality when I read Underworld. If you were to ask me what I remember most in the book, I reviewed it for Harper's, which meant I had to read it in a hurry, alas. After the Pafco prologue, which I've read a few times since, uh, and which is just fabulous, um, would come a few discreet plotless episodes. I remember the fictional Eisenstein film Unterwelt with the figures going across this blasted landscape which evokes the nuclear age that comes later. Uh, the ongoing Lenny Bruce bid about the Cuban Missile Crisis. The Lenny Bruce stuff is just incredible. Uh, uh, Nick Shea's very Burroughs-like shooting of the waiter George. Sorry, spoiler. And most of all, a section about 540 page in, which a number of commentators have now named, or referred to rather as Name the Parts. Nick has been sent to a Jesuit school upstate for troubled kids. Nick Shea is sort of the main character of the book, um, and the only person who speaks in the first person in the book, as I recall. Um, he's been sent upstate to a Jesuit kind of reform school for troubled kids who were gifted also. It's kind of a weird place. He is instructed by a particular Jesuit with whom he grows close, Father Paulus. One day, Paulus, I should say, one day Nick goes out into a massive blizzard, the school is not far from the Canadian border, and walks to Father Paulus's office for a visit, a 300-yard walk through a billowing white storm, in quotes. Father Paulus, earlier in the day, had answered a young man's question in class about the rumors that were then going around about Pius XII having mystical visions answer with the remark, if you'd been drinking Dago Red till three in the morning, you'd have visions too. Father Paulus, that is to say, is not an Italian. And indeed, formed in Cardinal Hayes and Fordham, Delillo's intellectual foundations in Catholicism have never felt to me in the least Italian. What they feel like to me is Irish, but, you know, forgive me, peeps, because um, I know that we got some Paisano, Paisani here tonight. Uh, but the, the, the specific sort of doctrinal investigation and the mystical investigations feel to me very Irish Catholic, Irish American Catholic at least. Anyway, Nick and Father Paulus start talking and Father asks Nick what he's reading and Nick recites a list and Father Paulus asks, you understand what's in those books? And Nick says, no. And then he says, but I understand a little bit, I understand some of it, but, and I try to memorize the rest. And Father Paulus says, this is not what you know, we're here for. Um, and he starts this discussion, which I'm going to read to you now. Sometimes I think the education we dispense is better suited to a 50-year-old who feels, this is Father Paulus talking, I'm, I apologize. Um, sometimes I think the education we dispense is better suited to a 50-year-old who feels he missed the point the first time around. Too many abstract ideas, eternal verities, left and right. 
you'd be better served looking at your shoe and naming the parts. You in particular, Shay, coming from the place you come from, which is a kind of an Irish, you know, little needle, just unnecessary, off the cuff, knife between the ribs. This seemed to animate him. He leaned across the desk and gazed, is the word, at my wet boots. Those are ugly things, aren't they? Yes, they are. Name the parts. Go ahead. We're not so she-she here. We're not so intellectually chic that we can't test a student face to face. Name the parts, I said. All right. Laces. Laces. One to each shoe. Proceed. I lifted one foot and turned it awkwardly. Sole and heel. Yes, go on. I set my foot back down and stared at the boot, which seemed about as blank as a closed brown box. Proceed, boy. There's not much to name, is there? A front and a top. A front and a top. You make me want to weep. The rounded part at the front. You're so eloquent, I may have to pause to regain my composure. <laughs> You've named the lace. What's the flap under the lace? The tongue. Well, I knew the name. I just didn't see the thing. He made a show of draping himself across the desk, writhing slightly as if in the midst of some dire distress. <laughs> You didn't see the thing because you don't know how to look. And you don't know how to look because you don't know the names. He tilted his chin in high rebuke, most theatrical, and withdrew his body from the surface of the desk, dropping his bottom into the swivel chair and looking at me again, and then doing a decisive quarter turn and raising his right leg sufficiently so that the foot, the shoe, was posted upright on the edge of the, at the edge of the desk. A plain, black, everyday, clerical shoe. OK, he said. We know about the sole and heel, yes. And we've identified the tongue and lace, yes, I said. With his finger, he traced a strip of leather that went across the top edge of the shoe and dipped down under the lace. What is that? What is it? I said. You tell me. What is it? I don't know. It's the cuff. The cuff. The cuff. And this stiff section over the heel, that's the counter. That's the counter. And this piece amidships between the cuff and the strip above the sole, that's the quarter, the quarter. And the strip above the sole, that's the welt. Say it, boy, the welt. How, <clears throat> how everyday things lie hidden because we don't know what they're called. What's the frontal area that covers the instep? I don't know. You don't know. It's called the vamp, the vamp. Say it, the vamp the frontal area that covers the instep. I thought I wasn't supposed to memorize. Don't memorize ideas and don't take us too seriously when we turn up our noses at rote learning. Rote helps build the man. You stick the lace through the what? This I should know. Of course you know, the perforations at either side of and above the tongue. I can't think of the word. Eyelet. Then he does think of the word. He says eyelet. Maybe I'll let you live after all. The eyelets, yes. And the metal sheath? At each end of the lace, he flicked the thing with his middle finger. This I don't know in a million years. The aglet, not in a million years. The tag or aglet, the aglet, I said. And the little metal ring that reinforces the rim of the eyelet through which the aglet passes. We do, we're doing the physics of language, Shay. The little ring. Yes, uh, the little ring. You see it? Yes. This is the grommet. He says, oh man, the grommet, learn it, know it, and love it. I'm going out of my mind. This is the final arcane knowledge. And when I take my shoe to the shoemaker and he places it on a form to make repairs, a block shaped like a foot, this is called a what? I don't know. A last. My head is breaking apart. Everyday things represent the most overlooked knowledge. These names are vital to your progress. Quotidian things. If they weren't important, we wouldn't use such a gorgeous Latinate word. Say it, he said, quotidian. An extraordinary word that suggests the depth and reach of the commonplace. And there follows a short passage in which Father Paulus takes Nick to task for signing a petition in support of Senator Joseph McCarthy. And then Nick goes back to his room. I walked back and forth across the parade in the blowing snow. Then I went to my room and threw off my jacket. I wanted to look up words. I took off my boots and wrung out my, 
I wrung out my hat, a cap, I think. I've, I mistyped here. I didn't type it out. Oh, I, I wrung out my cap over the wash basin. I wanted to look up words. I wanted to look up velleity and quotidian and memorize the fuckers for all time, spell them, learn them, pronounce them syllable by syllable, vocalize, phonate, utter the sounds, say the words for all they're worth. This is the only way in the world you can escape the things that made you. Escape the things that made you. So much is suggested in that phrase. For Nick Shea of the Bronx and Don DeLillo of the Bronx, such words lifted them up in a way, at least from the place that made them. But here you see also the sacramental view, the power of the words to transform, not merely experience, but reality itself. Say it. Say it. The priest during the, Eucharist pray, the Eucharistic prayer takes the celebrant's large host and he says, fruit of the earth and work of human hands, he recites. It's amusing to learn that this construct, the sacrament as work of human hands, which was introduced into the modern demotic liturgy after the Second Vatican Council, might have come from the once discredited and banished scholar Teilhard de Chardin, de Chardin whom de Lillo studied at college and whose ideas inform Point Omega. To digress even further, it's an idea that Chardin wrote about in the 20s during the height of, of neo-Thomism in France. And it was one of the French neo-Thomists, Jacques Maritain, who wrote about Thomas's definition of art as being essentially a matter of work. Art as the activity of the artist making the correct determination of work to be done. Ars recta ratio factibilium, for you Latin, uh, Latinists out there. Thus completing the sequence that links mystery to sacrament sacrament to work and work to art, and therefore that links flesh to spirit. Anyway, back to the priest. He takes the large host and he breaks it as one would break bread at a meal, as one breaks the unleavened bread at the Passover Seder. He prays over it and over the wine, which is the fruit of the vine and work of human hands. And then he leans over the bread, the large broken one which he holds in the first three fingers of each hand, keeping it together and all the other hosts for the communicants, which are laid out on the paten or piled in the ciborium, depending on how many he needs to consecrate, and adopting the voice of Jesus from the Passover meal that preceded his arrest, according to the evangelists, the priest invites the congregants, congregants to take and eat the bread. The priest leans down. This is what I remember so well from my church-going years. And he speaks right at the bread. This is how literal the Catholic training is. I never failed to be galvanized by this moment when I was still a churchgoer. He speaks right onto the bread and over the bread so that the words themselves, like waves, will push into the host so that the power of the words will wash over the whole thing, the piles of hosts. This fascinated me as an altar boy because I would watch the priests bend over the host in this way and I'd be off to the side and I could see their lips I could see them pointing the words right at the bread. It was a kid thing, this belief in the magical power of that kind of proximity, that special proximity. And what does the priest say? He says, this is my body. And with that, the Catholic believes material reality is changed. It doesn't matter for this discussion. It doesn't matter though we have to acknowledge that for some people as a condition of eternal salvation, it matters very much indeed, but it doesn't matter for us here tonight whether this faith in transubstantiation is ridiculous or insane or quaint or reasonable, whether it's false or true, whether this industrial produced Catholic communion wafer thing, which is unlike any other food substance I've ever encountered in my time on earth, whether these wafers actually become the body of Christ God, made incarnate in the first century man from the Roman province of Palestine, become his flesh? No. This is not the sacramental vision I'm referring to. What matters for us tonight, and for looking at DeLillo, is our understanding of what it might mean to grow up in a world, a complete world, a world that needs no explanation, a world of home, in other words, a place that one suspects in DeLillo's case was a stable world, a world enclosed and familiar as old shoes, growing up in a world in which words on a daily basis have that kind of power, 
and where an entire intellectual architecture that purports to prove that words have this power has been constructed, and where you go to school for 17 years, more or less, where you learn this architecture and absorb it aesthetically, and where this cathedral of ideas is as beautiful and complete an intellectual construct as any working class boy will ever encounter again. This, I'm convinced, is what we need to understand about DeLillo, what his readers need, finally, to get a sense of, that for him, every sentence, every word matters, and is, in a mysterious sense, matter, subject to transubstantiation. DeLillo has several times compared writing to sculpture, the words being carved onto the page. In this scheme, in this set of aesthetic principles, this set of standards, as he would say, regarding language, there is no waste regardless of whether the sentence is Baroque or plain, there is never a word used merely to take up space. There's none of this no she shrugged thing that still inexplicably dominates so many narrative voices in our putatively serious fiction. More than for any writer I can think of in English over the last century going back, that is, to his fellow Irish Catholics, Beckett and Joyce, for Don DeLillo, every single word has to be true. The duty to the language <clears throat> is sacred at that level. For this reason, I believe he is the most serious writer of our time, the most serious writer in an era when we've almost been convinced, almost, to forget what serious really means. Thank you. Thank you, Vince. I have so much to discuss with what you said. Um, thank you, everybody, for your attention. Why don't we take a, a short break, and we will come back with our first and only panel for this evening. Thank you, Vince. <laughs>